of us to be in glory together. All of us looking at each other one day, realizing this was nothing about our worthiness or our ability, but you saved us while we were yet your enemies. Father, thank you for that salvation. Father, we also pray for physical needs today of so many people. Lord, as we think of what's happened in Texas and Louisiana and all the speculations of what caused that or what's behind that or why you allowed that to befall them, Father, we, we don't know the depths of your ways, but we, we know that there are so many people that are in trouble with you at this very hour in that time. Father, we do pray for safety for people. We pray that uh, there wouldn't be outbreaks of sickness and waterborne problems. And Lord, there's just still so many people that are displaced. And God, they're also lost and without you, many of them. So God, we pray for them this morning. Father, we also lift up this situation with North Korea. God, it is so tense. It is so, on the face of it, it's so ridiculous that this man... Uh, is allowed to posture and threaten and do these things. And Father God, we would ask that it would not break into a full-blown nuclear situation. Lord, whatever you want to do to stop that situation from escalating, if indeed that is your will, we ask that you would do so and we will praise you for it. God, we pray for the people of that nation and the people of South Korea and China and Japan, everybody around there, and Lord, the, indeed the people in our own country who are being threatened at this very hour by this evil man. Father, I pray for his salvation. God, nobody is beyond saving. If you want to save that ruler of that nation, God, we believe you can. So, I, Lord, I don't even know how to pray other than to leave it in your hands. But, God, we pray that folks will turn to you in the midst of these days. Father, so much turmoil, so many other things. Lord God, the tensions at the Temple Mount, the... Uh, threat of Islam, all of the things that we see unfolding every day at such an accelerated rate. Lord, we admit and we confess that you are in control of these things. You know about them. Nothing is taking you by surprise. But Father, let us be faithful in this hour. And God, if you do not want to keep us from persecution, God, we ask that you walk through us with it, you know, through, through it with us. And Father, we want to minister in the strength that you provide here today. And thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. We are on and live, so I'm going to say one more quick prayer and get out of the way. Moriel Ministries, God is my teacher is what it means. Has anybody heard of Jacob this morning? <laughs> Praise God. We're so happy to have our brother. I'm going to pray for him. Father, again, we ask for Jacob today that you would just give him the words to speak. God, I know that it is coming from your scriptures today. So, Father, I just pray that he would clearly and wonderfully communicate with the love that he has for your word uh, in ministry to us today. And, Father, I pray in advance for people that are going to see this online all week. And, Lord, that you would just work in their hearts as they hear this great teaching from your awesome word. Be with Jacob. Thank you for bringing him here safely and for all that are with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Jacob Prash. Okay. I just need to do a very brief TV commercial for Moriel TV, just an announcement where I'm going to be next week. So pardon me for just one second, then we'll resume in just a half second. <coughs> Blessings, dear friends, from Columbus, Ohio. Happy to be with you this week. Next Sunday we'll be in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Lord willing. And we'll have classes in Argentina as well from the Word of God. We hope you can join us. Details will be available on our Spanish website, moriel.org. Buenos dias, hermanos y hermanas en Cristo. Yo soy Jacobo Prash. Hoy, nosotros estamos aquí en Colombia, uh, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. Pero en otras semanas, nosotros tenemos clases de Biblia en Argentina, en Buenos Aires. La información y direcciones para la iglesia están en nuestro website, Moriel.org en español. Gracias. Okay, now we can get down to business. <laughs> <laughs> Not an easy subject today, but let's go to the beginning. We are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. Whether we like it or not, we all have an old nature. We don't like it, but we have one. And there is an element of Adam and an element of Eve in all of us we can see the old nature. 
When we're born again, we're of the last Adam, but when we're born, we're of the first Adam. We see their nature in us. Secondly, we have the father of all who believed, Abraham. A Gentile who God converted to Judaism. He's the father of all who believed, Abba Abraham. And his darling wife, Sarah, which means princess, his half-sister. As the father of all believed, we have to understand the Hebrew concept of sonship. We are in his character. There's an element of Abraham and an element of Sarah in all of us, whether we like it or not. The scriptures are not hagiographic. They don't tell a fairy tale making somebody going around with a halo. They don't do what is done in hagiographies. They don't do what's done in the Book of Mormon or in the Koran. The scriptures are quite realistic. Speaking of Abraham and Sarah, it tells us their virtues. It tells us Abraham was a Yedidiah, Jedidiah, a friend of God, a friend of Yahweh. He had a face-to-face -face relationship with the Lord. Abraham actually walked with Jesus at Elon Moreh in Israel, near Shechem. He actually saw the Lord as a Christophany. He was the father of all who believed, many virtues, many positive traits, but also negative ones. He lied to save his own skin. <laughs> he did some rather treacherous things in Egypt. He was demonstrably a flawed man, as well as a virtuous man. And Sarah, a flawed woman, as well as a virtuous one. There is Adam and Eve and all of us in our old nature, and there is Abraham and Sarah and all of us. We can see the virtues engendered in us by second birth, but we can still see the rudiments of the old nature from the first birth. Bit of Adam, bit of Eve, bit of Abraham, and a bit of Sarah. We've explained many times, and my apologies to those who know this, that the fall has affected men and women both in different ways. Because of the fall of man, men have become insensitive. Because of the fall, women have become hypersensitive. When a man, men and women get saved, if a wife and husband get saved, it's usually the wife who gets saved first. If a woman has a husband who becomes a Christian, the wife usually, not always, but usually, she becomes a Christian. When the boots are on the other feet, it's not always like that. There are many godly women who struggle through decades with unsaved husbands. Even if he's a good guy, he's decades with unsaved husbands. Why is it usually easier for women to get saved than men? Because men are rendered, rendered insensitive by the fall. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest. A praying wife, not a nagging wife, but a praying wife is your most important counselor if you're a Christian husband. Ah, nagging turns the guy right off. But a praying wife, it's a foolish man who does not listen to a wife who's given to prayer. Nonetheless, let's continue looking at this now. Ah, men are insensitive. That's their problem. Women, however, are hypersensitive. While it's easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, women are much, much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men. Women can be spiritually seduced and deceived much more easier than men. A male is better able to keep a distinction between intellect and emotion than a female. Even professional women, women who are in the professions, lawyers, physicians, engineers, they may be very proficient, as good as any man in their profession, but when it comes to relational issues, women are still women. Spiritually, women are still women. The man is insensitive because of the fall, the woman is hypersensitive and much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. As we always say, the male antenna is too short, the female antenna is too long. Men don't get the signal, but when they get it, it's usually the right one. When they finally get it, it's usually the right one. Females, women can pick up two contradictory signals at the same time and somehow make sense of them. I've seen women make arguments that very few men would make. They try to make arguments. I know Christian women dating unsaved, unsaved guys, and you show them from Scripture, this is heading for trouble. 
You show them, look, I know many Christian women with unsaved husbands. None of them are happily married, even if he's a good guy. She's still sleeping in the same bed with somebody who's going to hell, and she's going to heaven. It doesn't work. But they still try to argue. A male wouldn't argue that way. But a female would somehow bend the scriptures to make it say what would gratify her emotions much more easier than a male. Men have got major problems. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. Women have major problems. They are reliant on male protection. It's not simply based on bigger orthomusculature. It is based very much upon the fact that while a man is thick, he's less likely to be conned. The serpent beguiled the woman. Eve being a personification and a type of Israel, and by extension and incorporation, the church. The serpent beguiled the woman. Paul makes this clear when he speaks to the church in the New Testament. He tells them, I'm afraid Satan's going to seduce you the way that Eve was seduced by the serpent, talking to the church. It's Israel, but it's also the church. Paul makes this clear. So, we begin in Ephesians 5, verse 22. Quite a passage indeed. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Now this does not mean if he tells you to do something immoral or illegal or completely irrational. <laughs> but it means everything according to the Word of God. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If your wife knows that you were willing to die to save her neck, that if it was you or her, you would die to save her life, it is much easier for a woman to be in submission to a man who she knows would die for her. <laughs> it's much easier. She's got to know that. Notice the female submission is dependent on the male letting her know he loves her that much that he would die in her place. If you're not willing to die in her place, you're not loving her the way Christ loved the church. Insubmission is going to be the result. And while it may be wrong on her behalf, it is your fault. You caused it. The impetus is always on the male. Eve fell first, but when Jesus came into the garden, Adam, what's going on? The woman, the woman. No, I'm talking to you, Adam. I'm talking to you, Jack. Something goes wrong in the marriage. Even if it's not the man's fault, it's his problem. Let's continue. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Notice the sanctification process of women is different than with men. We've been saved, but we're being saved. We were justified, but we're being sanctified. In the future, we shall be redeemed. We've been saved, we're being saved, we shall be saved. Salvation is past, present, and future. But the sanctification of the woman who is married through a married woman comes via her husband. She must see the sanctifying power of Christ through her husband. How does this happen? By washing of the water of the word. Is he applying the word of God in their marriage and in their family relationship? If he is not, he is a failure. It is a shame and a disgrace when the husband is not the spiritual head of the marriage. Now I understand there's circumstances where the wife may become a believer before the husband and he's a new believer and there's a transition process. But even in those circumstances, he must increase. <laughs> He's got to take responsibility as he grows in his faith. Okay. He has to apply the washing of the water of the word. This is what the word of God says. When, 
she begins to argue and contend otherwise, she's got to understand she's not arguing against her husband. She's arguing against the Lord. When she is not in submission to a protective husband, it is the church being not in submission to Jesus. One reflects the other. Now we have other teachings where we explain this at much greater depth, but let's look. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. You think that you have a role in making your wife holy and blameless. As Jesus says, the church. Love your wives as your own bodies. You know, <laughs> sexual ethics is simple for Christians. Her flesh is your flesh. Your flesh is her flesh. You wouldn't abuse your own flesh. Don't abuse hers. It's pretty simple. <laughs> At least the principle is simple. Yeah. Well. Washing with the water of the word. The husband must apply the word. Both in the church and in the marriage, leadership is male. Women can teach other women, older women teach younger women, but congregational leadership is male, marital leadership is male. When it doesn't happen, however, there's a problem, but the problem, although it involves the woman being insubmissive, it is the responsibility of the male. If he is being what he's supposed to be and doing what he's supposed to do, it is less likely there's going to be a submission problem. If she knows you would die in her place, and if she knows that you are always applying the word of God to every situation, and the marriage, the family, the relationship, the whatever, the children, whatever it is, she sees that and knows that. Well, she is much less likely to kick up a fuss. Much less likely. Now, if she does, that's her problem. Your problem, but she's got a problem with God, not with you. But let's look at this. You see, it's easy to say that there's an element of Adam and every male and an element of Eve and every female. It's easy to say that, and nobody would get offended. People know that. Christians know that, certainly. And it's relatively easy to say and get away with it without offending anybody. There's an element of Abraham and an element of Sarah in all of us. Extreme virtue, godliness, at the same time, the ugliness of the old nature. It's all, you can say that. People know it's true, at least Christians do. But now we come to the third case, which makes us much less comfortable. It certainly makes me much less comfortable. There can be an element of Ahab in every male and an element of Jezebel in every female. That's much less comfortable to deal with. Much less comfortable. Abraham was not such a great king. He wasn't such a good guy. But neither was he such a bad guy. He certainly wouldn't have been as bad if he was if it wasn't for his wife. And she would not have been able to wreck the havoc she did if he had been what he was supposed to have been. I'm not picking on women. I'm not a misogynist. I don't think women should be subjugated per se. My wife always beats me in mud wrestling. <laughs> let's not go to it. <laughs> but let's look at the background. Eve, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, she was seduced first. Satan didn't go for Adam, he went for Eve, and this was before the fall. 
Once the fall happened, now she's super vulnerable to seduction. He comes when the man is not there. If the man is not being the spiritual covering and protector, she is super vulnerable. Just like the church is super vulnerable when it is not under the headship of Christ. The husband's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Then we go to Sarah, the matriarch, and Abraham, the patriarch. Okay. She's got tremendous anxiety, postmenopausal, desperate need of a baby. How am I going to get pregnant? I'm past it. Hang it up, Granny. It's over. No, no, no. She cooks up an idea, the ancient equivalent of surrogate motherhood. No IVF in those days. It was called Bebir Kaim, literally on the knees. Proxy sex with a female maidservant that would literally recline on the knees of the wife and the baby would be born in the same position. That would be like the birthing stool <laughs> for maternal delivery of the baby obstetrically. Baby at a time, on the knees. And to push back on the knees when you're trying to push the baby out. That's how they did it. And then for all legal purposes, the baby would be considered the son of the wife instead of, of the maidservant, Hagar. Okay. Now, there was a kind of surrogate motherhood that God did ordain, Leverite marriage, but that's something else in the book of Ruth. It relates, but it's separate. We have other teachings addressing it. We're looking at Abraham and Sarah now. So they have the Ishmael. To this day, all these events you see John Haller talking about every week, or myself or others talking about in the Middle East. Seminally, the root of most of that goes back to Abraham and Sarah. Later, of course, to Isaac and Rachel with Jacob and Esau, but incipiently with Hagar giving birth to Ishmael. God says to Abraham, take Isaac, your only son. The Lord never recognizes anything done in the flesh. Take your only son. Now, this does not mean that God does not love Arabs and all this stuff. Again, we have other teachings explaining the anthropology of these things. We're simply dealing with typological illustrations of the truth. God does not recognize anything done in the flesh. Take your only son, Isaac. There are promises for Ishmael, of course, etc. in the Arab nations. Nonetheless, let's look at this. Take your only son. Out of insecurity, she nags, she hounds her husband into doing something he otherwise would not have done. Look with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 21. Verse 9, it's better to live on the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Verse 19, it's better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. Now again, there are typological meanings to these things, but the book of Proverbs tells us a woman who continually nags her husband is like a drip, a dripping faucet, as it were. They didn't have faucets, but they had a spout. Drip, 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 drip. He'll do anything to shut her up. He's got two choices, <laughs> homicide or give in to her. <laughs> How long have you been married, Reverend? I've been married to the same wife for 59 years, praise the Lord. Have you ever considered divorce? Never. Murder weekly, but divorce never. <laughs> This drives a guy nuts. Now, understand this. We're talking about the Jezebel spirit and the Ahab spirit. 
The Ahab spirit is obvious. It is when a male is not the spiritual head. That's obvious. With the Jezebel spirit, we have to talk about predisposition from two aspects. The first is vulnerability, and the second is targeting. What kind of women are predisposed to this? Vulnerability and targeting. I'm not into psychobabble or psychotheology. However, it is undeniable. It is common sense, and I can find scriptural examples. Women who have had bad fathers, such as Michelle and King Saul's daughter. Okay. Women who have had bad paternal relationships or have been hurt by a male in some devastating way, naturally tend to carry that baggage into their own marriage. You've got to understand the principle of new creation. You marry that man, not your old man. You marry this man, not the other man who hurt you. But there is a predisposition to carry the baggage. Women who have been hurt are the most vulnerable to being taken in by the Jezebel spirit. Okay. Second, women who are married to males in leadership, to pastors, to evangelists, to missionaries, to eldership or leadership in the church, to people in full-time ministry, women who are married to men in leadership. The devil is going to go after the man through his wife. Either she is going to be his helpmate or she's going to be a Mary Wesley, John Wesley's wife, uh, a hindrance, an, in, uh, an instrument of Satan that the, the, the devil continually used to try to destroy his ministry. Uh, she's going to be one or the other. When a woman is driven by the insecurity of Sarah, that compounds it. If she is not seeing the leadership, the love of Jesus, the protection of Jesus, and the authority of Jesus by applying the word of Jesus, this insecurity is going to propel her to behave like Sarah did. And it's going to go on. Drip, drip, drip. Give me children or I die, etc. Now, there are lots of women like Sarah. It doesn't mean they're bad. There are lots of women who were hurt in childhood by males, even abused, even sexually abused. That doesn't mean they're bad. On the contrary, they're the victim. But it does mean that they are more vulnerable to this kind of seduction. The devil knows he can get to them easier. And if they are married to somebody in leadership, they become a target because the real target is who they're married to. Understand how the devil works. He can't get to Jesus, so he tries to get to Jesus through the church, doesn't he? He couldn't get to Yahweh, so he tried to get to Yahweh through Israel. Now, with these things in view, let's understand how this happens. Once again, Revelation chapter 2. Of the seven churches, Theatita, the church of continual sacrifice, is arguably the worst. It is arguably the worst. The woman Jezebel personifies spiritual seduction, according to Jesus. The way she operated illustrates the way spiritual seduction works obviously leading up to the great harlot of Revelation 17 and 18, etc. There's that whole aspect. Thyatira having to do with idolatry, the church of continuing sacrifice, etc. 
I have a book on the dilemma of Laodicea. We explain these things in depth. But let's look. The Son of God who has eyes like flames of fire and his feet are burnished bronze. Each church sees some aspect of Christ highlighted in the first chapter that they need to see about him. He sees what's really happening. And he comes with feet of burnished bronze. Bronze is due with judgment, the altar. The brazen altar. I know your deeds and your love and your faith and service and perseverance. And that your deeds of late are greater than at first. These are good people initially. A good church. He speaks of, look at this. What they do, their good deeds, their love, agape love, real love, the love of the Lord, their faith and their service, and their hoopamony, their perseverance. They wouldn't give in to certain things that others would. And he says they've even cleaned up their act. They're better than they used to be. How does such a good church turn into such a bad one? How do such good people end up knowing what Jesus calls the deep things of Satan? How does it happen? How are people who are so nice and so good and who have so much right and have even improved and get the commendation of Christ for doing so, how do they end up so treacherously bad? The spirit of Jezebel. It happens in a church. It happens in a marriage. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. <coughs> Let us look. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. You tolerate that Greek term we translate as tolerate means that you allow or accommodate something you know is not right. You are willing to allow or to accommodate something you know is not right. Perhaps to placate her. Perhaps because you want to be a nice guy and a loving husband, but you have a wrong idea of what a loving husband is. God's idea of a loving husband is washing with the water of the word, applying the scripture. But the carnal idea of a loving husband is just being a nice guy all the time in such a manner as he's willing to accommodate or give in to things that he knows are wrong. She wouldn't have been as bad as she was when you read 1 Kings if her husband had been what he was supposed to. And he certainly wouldn't have been as bad as he was had he done what he was supposed to. The blame is primarily on the Ahab. Once this wild stallion escapes from the corral, it is pointless bolting the gate. Once this wild stallion gets loose, it is nearly impossible, nearly impossible to get it back in, to corral it again. You're going to need one heck of a lasso, one heck of a lariat, and be really good with it. Once the relationship maritally has gone that far, once this kind of thinking takes root in the church, once it gets going, it becomes very, very difficult to stop it. Now let's look at her. She confuses spirituality with carnality. 
men can do this too. We've seen this in the counterfeit revivals that we've had over the last 20 years in Toronto and Pensacola and things like that. People are doing things that are carnal, that are basically an emotionally charged religiosity with wild manifestations and things, often influenced by Eastern religion. And they don't, they're too ignorant to know it, and they think it's spiritual. But you see it in the church. Jim Baker would not become as bad as he did if he wasn't married to Tammy. She would not have become as bad as she was had he been what he was supposed to. I know people who knew Jan and Paul Crouch in the beginning. They didn't begin so wicked. They ended that way. Same story. Juanita Byram and her husband giving a marriage conference. After the conference, they get arrested in the church parking lot or something because they had a fight and he's on top of it beating her up after the, the marriage. <laughs> they have a Jezebel. Pay attention. The Greek uses the diminutive. And Peter, adorn yourself modestly. In the Song of Solomon, you see makeup and cosmetics in a Jewish culture were not morally improper. But in the Greek culture, they could be the uniform of the Hegel's Gamos, of the temple prostitutes. You understand? So Paul is saying, don't do it. The principle is modesty. I'm not against women wearing jewelry or makeup or anything like this. But there is a reason. You see these female tele-evangelists. This stuff you see with Hillsong and, and, and the late Tammy Baker. She'd come out, and every time they called her husband a crook, which she was, she'd begin crying, and the mascara would go down her face, and she looked like a hybrid of Miss Piggy and the Bride of Frankenstein, and the world would make fun of her. The world would mock her openly. The world would openly mock her. And people think that's born again. Jan Crouch, Paula White, there's a reason these women look like old whores. There's a reason they resemble the harlot of Revelation 17. It is because they have become personifications of the harlot church. You understand? There's a reason they dress like that. I'm convinced. There's a reason they look so gaudy and whorish. They become personifications of the harlot church. Now let's look at this. He's talking to them. The characteristics. She calls herself a prophetess. The first characteristic is a tolerated in submission. The insubmission is the fault of the woman. The toleration of it is the fault of the man. Second, she calls herself a prophetess. When a woman comes under this influence, she thinks She hears from God. She's simply gratifying her emotions, but she's convinced. She's personally convinced she's hearing from the Lord. And of course, if you don't agree that she's hearing from the Lord, it's because you are not hearing from the Lord in her mind. <laughs> Where is the washing of the water, the word? Where is it? There is a woman with mouths on her board who on her website and on her radio program, on her website, actually has people she knows to be heretical. 
people who teach that Christians are not under the new covenant. And the male Christians on her board let her do it. She's not married. That is the Jezebel spirit. It's the Jezebel spirit. And she appeals to other women. It's the Jezebel spirit. Well, she thinks she hears from God. But she's actually seduced. What happens next? She will take on some kind of seriously false doctrine. Well, the Jezebel spirit is there, the woman will get involved in some kind of false doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, with historical Jezebel, it was easy. She was a Phoenician. Yahweh was Israel's Baal, being the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner, as most of you know. Israel's Baal was Yahweh. But the Canaanites had a Baal that rose from the dead every spring. You got a ball, we got a ball, everybody's got a ball. Two people named, uh, you know, Robert Phillips in the Columbus Telephone Directory. Does that mean they're the same Robert Phillips? Well, two people named Jesus Christ. We're the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. Yeah, your Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. Allahu Akbar! The Koran speaks about Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's a prophet inferior to Muhammad who was not the son of God. It's a different Jesus. This is the American Midwest. Originally settled by the French. To this day, there's a strong Roman Catholic influence in the Midwest. How many people here are ex-Roman Catholics? Put your hand up. See? Somewhere within a half hour drive from here right now, there's a Roman Catholic mass. Our Jesus said, if anybody says I've returned physically, don't believe them. He's in the wilderness, don't go there. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. I'm coming back the way I left. No, he comes back under the appearances of bread and wine. He physically returns by transubstantiation. They pray to the bread and wine, calling it the blessed sacrament. They actually worship it. Then they kill him again sacramentally and eat him cannibalistically and drink his blood. If it's his real blood, why are you drinking it? Acts 15, the apostle said, don't do that. This is a different Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. The Islamic Jesus is a prophet who is not God's son and inferior to Muhammad. The Eucharistic Jesus of Rome is bread and wine. That's all. It's a memorial. Not to them, that's him. Twisting John 6 out of all context. Okay. The New Ages have Matria, the cosmic Christ. They've all got a Christ. But it's not the same Christ. Jezebel's thing was, we got ball, you've got ball, it's the same ball, we can be one. That's how Israel was seduced. That's how the church is being seduced today with the ecumenical movement and the interfaith movement. Oh, Catholics are Christians. Yeah, there are Catholics who are Christians, but if they're real Christians, the Holy Spirit is going to show them to get out of the Roman church. Come out of her, my people. Oh, we just have to love. Somehow love and truth become mutually exclusive. She's thinking with her emotions. And when the male leadership of the church gives into this, look at it. Once you tolerate the insubmission, she's going to go on thinking she's hearing from God and she is inevitably going to get into serious false doctrine. Understand the mass is idolatry. It is false doctrine. It's another Christ. Oh, but they're against abortion. They're 
we're moral people? Yeah. They just invited Cardinal Pell two weeks ago when I was in Australia. Last week, they re-indicted Archbishop Thomas O'Brien in Phoenix. Every diocese in the United States has been there. They're not moral. It's a corrupt religion. Forbidding marriage, teaching a doctrine of demons. You outlaw what's natural, people will do something unnatural. Oh, you're a mother, you're a no, I'm scriptural. But Jezebel doesn't want to hear it. False religion gets in. Whose fault is it? The leadership of the church. I remember the disgusting book, Ecumenical Jihad written by Peter Kreeft, claims to be a former evangelical turned Catholic. Mohammed is in heaven, Buddha is in heaven. We have to have ecumenical union with Islam to morally redeem society. Who endorsed that book on the cover? Who endorsed it? J.I. Packer, the reformed Calvinist theologian, the late Chuck Colson, among others. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who beguiles my servants. What does Jesus then say? I gave her time to repent. But she doesn't want to repent. Once that horse escapes from the corral, Good luck, you're going to need it. To try to get it back in? <laughs> you can't control her anymore. Just look at a marriage where this happens. She refuses repentance. She just persists in it. Then, the fifth one. What did Jezebel do next? Ahab wouldn't confront her. As a result, the whole nation is being seduced and misled. There's only 7,000 not taken in by it, plus Elijah. So Elijah confronts her. Then Elisha confronts her, and finally King Jehu confronts her and puts an end to her. Because her husband doesn't control her, God will get others who will stand up to her. But then she goes on the warpath. She becomes incensed with rage. Where the Jezebel spirit is, you will see an unleashed hostility when confronted. Hell knoweth no fury, like the scorn of a Jezebel. Now there's always a factor that sooner or later becomes apparent. It's usually not apparent at first, but given enough time, it will manifest. She wanted neighbor's vineyard. Yeah. There's a selfish ambition. 
It might be materialistic, financial, whatever. Quest for power. But ultimately, she's heading for Revelation 17. I sit as a queen. You understand? Vanity consumes her. Mirror, mirror on the wall. I sit as a queen. You let her go long enough, selfish ambition is going to overtake her. She's wearing the trousers. Ahab is wearing the skirt. <coughs> well, we see this in 1 Kings 21. But then what happens? The seventh step. <coughs> Judgment. And the judgment of Jezebel is not pretty. It prefigures the judgment of the great harlot in Revelation. You see it in 2 Kings 9.33. Just think, a puddle of blood with a skull and two hands in it. A skull, woman's two hands, and dogs lapping up the blood. Ugly scene. That's what becomes of her. Judgment. But it takes a long time. The Lord is very forbearing towards her. After Rahab, then there's Elijah, Elisha, finally Jehu. The judgment tarries. But when it comes, it comes. Most Jezebels get away with it a long time because she's a judgment in part on her husband. He's reaping the ramifications. He deserves a woman like that. Now the text of Kings, if you understand it, it's contrasting her to the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4 or the widow's oil or the uh, widow with the dead son. It's contrasting her to the good women, you understand? The good women are types or pictures of the bride of Christ, as it were, or faithful Israel. She's always in contrast to these other women, to the Proverbs 31 woman, picture of the perfect bride of Christ. Well, that's it. The judgment comes. But that's not the end of it. Now notice, Jesus says, I'm going to kill her children and stuff like this. It messes up families and marriages, you understand? And the next generation can bring these traits with them into their own marriages. An abusive husband and father is going to mess up his sons. An overly permissive one who's not the spiritual head and does not apply the word, he's going to mess up his sons. A woman like that is going to mess up her daughters. Now again, there's much, much more to this than what we're talking about. You can get the book, The Dilemma of Laodicea. But again, he has the eyes of fire. He searches the minds. He knows what's going on. And he says, there are those who do not know the deep things of Satan. This is not just something demonic, it is something satanic. The serpent beguiled the woman. Paul says, Satan got to Eve. He's trying to get to the church. It's the devil. To take such a good church with such good people who Christ commends so richly and who even improved 
for them to end up in that state. All it takes is an Ahab and a Jezebel. That's all. Now understand this. The way the Jezebel spirit works is the woman uses the husband. A faithful bride seeks the honor of her husband. He, in turn, honors her. The faithful church seeks the honor and glory of Jesus. He, in turn, honors and glorifies her. Where the Jezebel spirit is, the husband is simply the meal ticket. You understand? <laughs> He's simply the vehicle. It's an Isaiah 28 thing, the self-glorification. Woe to the crown of the proud drunkards of Ephraim. It's that kind of Isaiah 28 situation. I know a pastor, a good pastor who speaks out on discernment issues. Personal friend, I love him. There are churches that will not allow him in even though they like him and agree with him because his wife has a Jezebel spirit and she travels around with them sometimes. And these pastors see it. I know th three pastors said we can't let, we, let him in because this is the... There's a woman on, on the radio. She's Jewish and she, she has good guests but she has heretics. Her board won't stop her. She has a Jezebel spirit. There's no stopping it. Yes, there is a bit of Adam and a bit of Eve in all of us expressed in our old nature. There is a bit of Abraham and a bit of Sarah in all of us expressed in our old nature. But unfortunately, there can also be a bit of Ahab and a bit of Jezebel in all of us expressed in our old nature. Now once she gets destroyed, once her game is over, once it happens, we see what comes next in 2 Kings 11. After Jezebel is gone, Queen Athlea shows up. You understand? She's worse. Jezebel works through an Ahab. Athlea, she doesn't need a man. She's a Joyce Meyer. Once you get rid of Tammy, once you get rid of Jan Crouch, you wind up with a Joyce Meyer. You wind up with a Queen Athlea. When you look at Joyce Meyer, pays herself 12 million a year plus royalties, the whole thing with the facelifts and the earrings and all of that stuff, and but then she tells you she had a really bad relationship with her father as a kid and all that. She's perfect sitting doc. Teaching error, teaching much false doctrine. She's confident, she, look how confident she is. She thinks she hears from the Lord. She's teaching error. I remember one time I was in Australia and the pastor showed me a, the videos in those days, it was videos, and he put on a video of her speaking on American television. You may have heard me say this. And she said, God gives you a receipt when you give him an offering. So when you give an offering to his work, by which, by implication, she meant her ministry, God gives you a receipt. It says in the original languages, she said, so that when you want something, you bring your receipt to God. Here's what. That's what she was teaching. Well, it so happens I can read the original languages. In Hebrew, the word for receipt is Kabbalah, Kabbalah, mystical Judaism, does not apply. In Greek, we have two words. 
Telestai only found that John's gospel paid in full. When Jesus paid for our sins, it was paid in full. And the other word is Zarabanon, meaning we usually translate it pledge or earnest. It's the Holy Spirit. It proves we were bought by the blood of Jesus. When he comes to pick up the parcel he purchased with his blood, he takes those who have the Spirit. That's what it's talking about. Those are the three words of the original languages. Kabbalah, Arabanon, and Telestai. Where she got hers, I don't know. She's just teaching error to get money out of people. No, Joyce Meyer is not a Jezebel. She's a Queen Athlea. She doesn't need a man. <laughs> Tammy Baker, she, that's a Jezebel. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But it happens. It happened to Israel. And both Paul and Jesus warned it can happen to the church. And it happened to nice people. To good people who have faith and love and perseverance and good works. It happened to good people. I know nice people. But there's something wrong. That wife has the Jezebel spirit. I know good churches, but women are the real powers on back of the proverbial throne. Not as advisors or as counselors, but as manipulators. It's a bad thing. Sooner or later, the judgment of God comes on Jezebel, and she gets really angry when somebody confronts her. She gets really angry. She demanded her husband kill Elijah, remember? Now again, there's a whole typology in this. Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist had the same spirit. The wicked woman put the king up to killing Elijah. John the Baptist, the same thing. The wicked woman, Herodias, put the king, Herod, up to killing John the Baptist was with the spirit of Elijah, and that points to Revelation. There's a whole other dimension of meaning in this, prophetically and eschatologically and so forth. But we're not looking at that now. We're looking at the Adam and Eve in us. Okay. The Abraham and Sarah in us. Okay. The Ahab and the Jezebel in us. Not so okay. I don't like this subject. It bothers me. And I know who Satan targets. Good people, good churches. Good leaders, good preachers. I know who's most vulnerable, where the insecurity comes from. I understand it. But it happens. Happened to Israel. Wrecked that nation. It wrecked that nation. It happened in Thyatira. It wrecked that church. And that same spirit is wrecking havoc today. It happened to Israel. It happened to Thyatira. Please, Jesus, don't let it happen to us. God bless. Let's have a break. <laughs>